touch the lives that need to be touched in special and powerful ways. Heal our hearts. Open our eyes. Let us be able to receive you and engage with you and be with you in all that we are. In Jesus' name. Fixing me? Oh, thank you. Hey, Marianne. Thanks, Steve. We love you, Steve. You know what? Thanks to Angie for setting up all the stuff this morning and getting it working. That is that is stressful. <laughs> I don't care who you are. Whenever you work with anything technical in the church or otherwise, it is stressful. So thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. You know, it's it's interesting how. Whenever we lose at something, or whenever we're beaten at something, we always feel that we're alone, right? Isolated, divided. That really is the agenda of the enemy, to divide and conquer. Because if you can isolate someone by themselves, because there's strength in numbers, but if you get somebody alone, you get someone who's weak, you get them to start believing lies about themselves, and they start getting beat up, oppressed, but then that becomes depression, it internalizes, we start viewing ourselves with the same language as being spoken at us, which is negative, which is damning, which is condemning, and we start to own that as our identity, and we start to isolate ourselves, and guess what? We're already defeated, and the enemy just picks at you, and picks at you, and picks at you, hoping that you'll just die. That really is. And the greatest lie that the enemy gives to us is you are worth nothing. That's the number one thing that whenever you talk to anyone who has suffered in any form, it's, it's something that can come up. It's, I'm just not worth it. Or it's not worth it. Or there seems to be this expression of a lack of value and identity and purpose and worth. And it is so powerful that it tends to define and constrain that person. And it changes their whole identity. You see, there's issues in life that come up. There's situations and hardships in life that will divide. Situations. Politics tends to divide people. Religion especially divides people. Religion in the sense of people chasing after God. See, what Jesus does is he flips that on its head and he says, I'm chasing after you. I'm coming for you which takes away any sort of division because if God is pursuing us all the time and He loves us enough to come as one of us, lowly, small. He wasn't born into a rich family. He was born in a stable that was for animals, okay? And He came up through the ranks and He served and He blessed and He showed and He loved and He healed and He spoke truth and wisdom and He chose 12 people who society and culture had cast aside to be less than and He built them up and 12 people through the grace of Jesus Christ have changed the world. The whole ministry of Jesus is to turn the world on its head and show you, no, you do matter. I do love you. Stop listening to the lies. Don't own the deceit. Let me in. I've got two quotes up here by Charles Spurgeon. And I do think that they are, they're technically unrelated, but I think they connect rather well. The first one says, I believe in a very large majority of churchgoers are merely unthinking, slumbering worshipers of an unknown God. Let that sink in for a second. Churchgoers, people who are going to church, meaning people who have their Facebook status set to Christian, meaning people who are going to high-five and they're going to wear the suits and the ties and drink the coffees at the cappuccino bars and use the free Wi-Fi and fellowship together and do Bible studies. These type of people, he's saying, a majority, not a small minority, a majority of these people are unthinking, slumbering worshipers of an unknown God. You know, the thing is, when we have these hardships that divide us and these situations come against us and we are oppressed in life and we are depressed in life and we are defeated, religion leaves us worse off than we would have been without it. Because at least if we're suffering alone and isolated without religion, we can't go to a false counterfeit thing and say, if I'm just a little bit better here, I can fix myself. Or if I just did more, if I just tithe more, or if I just curve the cursing down in my language a little bit, or if I read my Bible more at 8.30 in the morning, or whatever it may be, we start adding these things which don't do a thing for us in our current circumstance. Jesus says, no, no. 
when I said it was finished on the cross, I meant it. Don't go to religion. Go to Christ because religion is empty and meaningless and will leave you burdened, beaten, and more isolated than without Him. Religion cannot give us purpose, reason, hope. It can't refute Satan's lies of you are not worth it. You are not worth a damn. Pardon the expression. Religion doesn't do that. Charles Spurgeon also says, Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Now, for anyone in this room, myself included, who's ever experienced anxiety, this is a big amen moment. Yes. Worrying about it and obsessing about it and letting it completely consume and control and dictate who you are and where you're going does not fix anything tomorrow. It just takes away all that you are today. You know, and I thought that was just a very powerful statement because undealt with issues the oppression that comes against us, when the enemy tries to creep in through the cracks in our armor, tries to tear us down from the inside out, you know, whether it be via religion or whatever it may be, will lead to an anxious lifestyle. And when we don't know God, and if we tend to be these slumbering, unthinking worshipers going through the religious routines, trying to do the right Christian things, but we're not connecting with God, we're still not going to see any change. See, coming to a service on Sunday morning and singing the words and listening to me or Derwin speak does not make any of us a better Christian. Going to Jesus Christ makes everyone a better person. Being a disciple of Christ and allowing Him into our lives to heal and bring forward a healing journey, no matter what the anxious thing is, that's what makes life better. Not me, not the worship, even though it's great, even though I'm pretty good, even though Derwin's good. You know what I mean? That doesn't make a difference on our quality of life. It's Jesus. It's not about religious leaders. It's not about a religious system. It's about Jesus Christ. And I mean, really, Ken, you nailed it when you said relationship. But the thing is, we really have to wrap our minds around that, that there is a supernatural thing that has happened that allows us to connect with God. Not just, oh, that's, that sounds like nice church words, but literally, we have the opportunity and ability to connect with Jesus. That's right. yeah. And if we don't believe it, we need to start giving our heads a shake and say, why am I here? Right. Am I a slumbering, unthinking worshiper of an unknown God, or am I someone who is loved, sought after, valued, given purpose, and I now understand the reason? For all things, and the reason is Jesus. That's the number one thing I think we can take away from Sunday school. Jesus is the answer. Yes. Yeah. That's the number one. And you know what? That's the best theology I've learned, including Bible college, was in what in Sunday school? Jesus. <laughs> That's it. Keep it simple. My mom uh, called me this week. My mom's a teacher's aide in Victoria, BC, and she works in uh, high school. And she works with a lot of kids who have uh, learning disabilities. And they had a very interesting situation this week where a child, well, kid to me, young student, left their classroom, crossed the school, got up, was obviously in distress, ran through their room, ran across the hallway into the next classroom, and ran right across the room where my mom was and went out the window in efforts to try and throw themselves out to die. And the only reason they didn't is because the teacher in that second room knew something was wrong and grabbed them as they went out the window and went out with them. And they sat on the ledge for about three hours while the police talked this kid down. Now, a lot of times you hear stories of youth threatening attempts in, in, in order to cry for help. This was not a cry for help. This was an attempt to die that was foiled by someone else interfering. And I thought about this for a while, and it bothers me beyond all to think of that there's, there's this much anxiety, there's this much separation and defeat, even in our youth today. In a society where we have so much and we are so blessed. I mean, I mean no one here is in prison for our faith. No one here is starving and wondering where our next meal is going to come from. And here's a kid. I don't say that in a demeaning way. It's because I'm 31 years old now. So looking at a high school Individual, they are kids to me because I value them as a child. All right? Here's a kid that is so broken, thinking this is the only way to fix everything, it's just to end it. 
there's something wrong. There's something so broken. Now, this is coming to a point, and hopefully it's, you know, I was talking with Angie and Steve at their Bible study for about, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes. And, you know, it really impressed me that one of the, the things that Angie does of her disciplines is she writes these cue cards with different scriptures that really speak to her. And she puts them, if you look in her office, on the one table, there's like, I don't know, there's got to be 30 or 40 or more cue cards with different scriptures to give encouragement to really be the voice of God to cling to, even when you're not feeling like it. Right? And she told me a story once. She had all these cue cards around her house. So you couldn't help but be surrounded by the promises and the voice of God. Amen. And I was like, you know what? Okay, so I'm taking that. And I want to give a few scripture references up on here this morning to deal with anxiety. Because I know I put this link on our church's Facebook page. So if you want to look at it, get it from there. Okay, So these are going to come up quickly. Starting in Isaiah 41. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 94. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. Psalm 34. I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. What this shows us is literally a picture of God caring and being present. Religion doesn't do that. Religion says, conform yourself to how I want you to look and maybe things will be better. Jesus says, I am with you. Let me be with you personally to help, to heal, to reveal something new to you that you cannot perceive right now. I'm going to do a new thing in your life. A new thing. Now this morning I want to go to Isaiah 43. But if you're going to follow along in your Bibles, it's going to be a little difficult because I'm removing terms like Israel or sons of Jacob. I want this to be personal for us this morning. So I've taken a few things out to make it so that it relates to us. Okay, so follow along behind me if you want. But this is Isaiah 43. This is a promise. This is a declaration of a change and healing journey. And here's one of the things that really ticks me off about life, okay? If you think about like a graph chart and you've got the line that goes up, right, for increased profits or increased whatever, when it comes to a healing journey on a personal level, it's never this linear thing where it's like, ah, zero to a hundred and it's a straight line. That would only make sense. But no, no, as people, we have to be products of a broken, sinful environment. Even though the image of God is being redeemed within us, it's this, this culture clash, right? Jesus at work making us like himself as disciples, but also being surrounded by an environment that is broken and sinful. So it goes like this, if it's anything like you. You go up, you backslide, and you go up, and you make a little bit more effort, and you drop down 10 steps again. It's not linear. It's up and down. It looks like a heart rate monitor rather than a graph chart. Yes. It ticks me off. I'm trying not to use the other word here. but it, whew. Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. So listen, ears open. Or one of those things I was always taught as a kid, which ticks me off too. God gave you two ears, so you need to listen twice as much as you speak. That didn't work out for me so well. I'm a preacher, so ha. Huh. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you. Everyone here this morning, when you take away one thing, you are made with intention, with purpose, with value. If anyone else says different, forget that. This is who you are. You are made on purpose. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. You are not a screw-up. Even though things may be hard now, your value comes from the fact that you are loved, made with intention, known by God, created, formed by Him. Derwin on, on Tuesday at the Bible study gave this, this terrifying statistic. And this is what... They took this... Uh, I just lost the word here. Here's the stat, anyway. They took a survey, that's the word. No survey. Just flutters. 17% of people, 17%, that's a big minority, identify as being lonely. And these are the people who actually tick the box, okay? There's a lot of, and what I mean by that is not that they feel alone, because you can be lonely in a group of people if you feel they don't care about you. 17% of people. 
But here's what Derwin said, and I love it. I'm going to leave it at this because he's probably going to go off on this in the next two weeks. But he's not here, so I'll steal his material like any other good preacher does. <laughs> if we are focused on loving the 17%, he said, don't just focus on the 17%. He said, focus on showing love and value in the way you speak and interact with everyone. That means 100% of people. And if you love and interact with people and show them value in the simple things, like going to a store, and even if the service is bad at the dinner table, making eye contact, looking for a name tag, asking them their name if they don't have one, and identifying them personally, saying, thank you for your service, even though it was crap. Maybe don't leave, you know, leave the last part out. But identifying with that person and just connecting and showing them value can make a big difference. If you do that to 100% of the people you encounter, you will get the 17% that are neglected and feeling isolated, because those isolated people are probably feeling anxious about life circumstances, are probably feeling divided, separated, defeated, broken, ready to throw themselves out a window. The simple things make a big difference when it comes to the love of Jesus Christ in us and through us. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. See, what I love about Scripture here is it doesn't BS us in the sense that, oh, when you come to Christ, everything's going to be peachy keen, you're going to be rich, life's going to be easy, you're going to have health, you'll never get a cold again, you'll never have to worry about paying taxes again. It, that, no, the, the, the reality is that there will be times when you have to pass through the river. When the waters are so aggressive and they're coming against you, it feels like you're going to drown, but guess what? You will not be there with you. Or when you walk through fire, that's kind of a strange visual to give to someone. When you are set ablaze, it will not consume. Huh? I don't remember signing up for that when I did the prayer and came to Jesus. No, but now you're already in, so too bad. But it will not consume. When you walk through fire, which is a scary and terrifying thought, you will not be burned, you will not be destroyed. But no one really wants to focus on the hardships of life and say, yeah, praise God. It's like, oh, kill me. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I'm with you. I see you. I know you. I'm going to be in it with you. You will survive. But that doesn't preach well from the pulpit when you say, sometimes the blessing is just surviving. It's like, sometimes it is. Hardships, hard things come against us. They are anxiety-causing for certain. 100%. I get that. I get that because I'm a human being. And the only reason I think I survive week to week at times is because of Jesus Christ and the faithful prayers from all congregate members here, okay? That's it. It's not that I'm that much better because I'm not. But those situations don't define you. When the fire comes against you and you're walking through it, that doesn't define you. When you're walking through the rivers and life is hard and you feel like you're drowning, it doesn't define you. What defines you is that you're loved by God and He's willing to be in it with you to keep your head above water, to keep you from being consumed by the flames. That love defines you. Do not listen to the lie saying, you deserve this. You are worthless. See, a lot of times I think we do become products of our environment. That is one of the wisest things that the world has ever given us. You become a product of your environment. You know what? That's true. And if our environment, our influence, our surrounding situation is what defines us and that becomes our pain and our hardship, then that will consume. But what we have to remember is that Jesus is in it with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And if Jesus is saying, come and follow me, like any good disciple wanted to hear from their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus is saying, 
Come and be like me. Come and do what I do. Come and give me your soul. And not only that, but what they're saying, what Jesus is saying is, I have faith in you to overcome. I have faith in you to walk through this with me, to be like me. I love you and see value in you. And if Jesus is the one that we're focusing on as our product of our environment, then we can't help but become like him even when the fires rage, even when the waters rise. We will become more like Christ he will become our environment influence. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I'm taking a break here. You know, I always hate it when Derwin does this, because I listen back to the recordings, and you can hear him put the lozenger in his mouth, and then... It's a bad habit he's got. I, I'll tell him to his face, but it's really easy when he's not here. But I listen back to the recording, and I'm just like, oh, thank you, Lord, thank you. I'm like, ew. Ew. <laughs> and now I just did it, so there you go. Let me reread that because I'm losing the anointing here. <laughs> Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I want you to repeat after me, I am precious. I am honored. I am, honored. I am seen. I am, seen. I, am I am loved. Good. See, the thing is, fear can be lifted. Anxiety can be removed. Healing can occur. But a lot of times I think that we are so afraid of whatever it is that's causing the anxiety in the first place that we'll give ourselves to Christ fully except for that part. The suffering is so great and so overwhelming, we can't even begin to think that there's something beyond right now in this moment. And we get stuck in a cycle that's vicious, that's painful, that's hurtful, that's damning, that is destructive. And Jesus is God in everything in our lives except for that. But God's saying, let me remove that. Give me an opportunity to take you on a journey of healing. It may not be linear, and it may have setbacks, and there will be. But I want to walk that with you. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I formed and made, lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. I like this part. He's giving a charge. He's saying, everyone who is changed by Jesus Christ, Gather those who are not yet. And that doesn't just extend to people who are not Christians. That extends to those who are in the church, who are churchgoers, who are slumbering, unthinking, and worshiping of an unknown God, who think they're doing the right things but do not know Him. Call them out. Show them me. Don't just suffer and heal and be done with it. Suffer, heal, and relate to others in that suffering who are also going through likewise similar pains. Show them the ways. Bring them to me because they can't see me. They can't hear me. But you can and you are my hands and my feet. Go, love, and bring them. Show them. I mean, that, that's the thing that blows my mind the most about God is that He is this ultimate God who has changed everything, made everything perfect. We screwed it up as people. You know, that's why I love... When you're reading Genesis, you're like, ah, oh, God made this and it was good. God made this and it was good. Then He made people. And it was very good. And that lasts for like a chapter and a half. And then everything goes to hell. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. I told you that you were going to die if you partook. You partook. I'm going to show you grace. I'm not going to kill you like I ought to. I'm going to clothe your shame. I'm going to be with you. But things have changed. There are repercussions for the choices you've made. And eventually I'm going to have to do something more to fix what you've broken. I'm going to have to send myself to live as one of you and to die for all of you. And then to raise again and to give life as an opportunity and an option if you choose it, because I love you. That's God. And once that happens, and once that change has taken place, I want to use you to bring people who have not experienced this to me. How can I be a broken instrument, which I am, and do the work of a perfect God, which he calls me to do. That is terrifying to me on most days. And yet Jesus has enough grace and love to be like, you're going to screw up, but I chose you because I love you. And you have value. 
And it starts to go against that programming when we suffer. Verse 9 says, All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble so that others may hear and say, It's true because you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen. That our testimonies, that our lives may impact people so much they say it is true, not just because we say so. We're not beating them overhead with a Bible and our stories. And, just accept Jesus. Do it. Or you're going to die here. You know, like, I, I think it was Eugene Peterson who wrote the, the translation for the message, the Bible, into a common modern day language. And it's, it's more of a, it's not so much a translation, it's more of a... Uh, Alliteration. He takes the main concepts and transforms them into modern day language. Okay, so it's not a word for word translation, it's concepts being brought into a modern language that speaks to people. But when he was a kid, he was bullied at school. And his mom always used to say, Well, you need to love him, 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 you need to love him. And then one day he was so fed up that he turned on the bully and he started pounding him into the ground. And he just said, Well, I have to do this the Christian way. He had this moment of conflict in his life. He said, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Say it. <laughs> and he beat this kid till he accepted Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way we need to evangelize. But sometimes that is the approach for people. Yeah, right? Like it's just, oh, well, you're a heathen. You're a this, you're a that. And we start to label people by their brokenness and, and activity and actions that we don't think are good. You know, the church is really good at beating people down and confining, constraining, unfortunately. It's those churchgoers who are slumbering and unthinking who don't know God, though. But what Jesus is saying is, I want you to go to the people who are not yet mine, or don't know yet that they are mine. Show them. Show them me. Let your healing be a testimony. Let your ability to relate to them and their suffering be a connection point of not only you two together, but me in that, in you, through you. This is not a religious burden of duty, okay? What I mean by that is this is not the Christian thing that you have to do. Well, you've come to Jesus now. Go out and save 12 people. Well, guess what? I couldn't save myself. I'm not going to be able to save 12 people. This is a response to the grace of Jesus Christ. It has to come from within. You know, Lord, if I am deaf to you, open my ears. If I am blind to you, open my eyes. Let me see you. Let me hear you. Let me be loved and valued by you and let me show other people that love and that value as well. So that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. This is my favorite part. This, this is the main, this is it. So just, if you want to focus on one thing this morning, what I'm saying, because I am a huge monologue speaker every Sunday for you, but forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. This is just like Peter when he was telling Jesus, when so Jesus walked on the water to him, Jesus, if it is you, command me to come to you. You are my teacher. You are the one I want to be like, and you are coming to me amidst a storm that is destroying my now. And Jesus comes through the storm unharmed, un, not even bothered. And he's walking on water, and they're terrified. And then Jesus says, no, 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 it's chill out. Slow your row. It's me. Okay, if it's you, tell me to come, command me to come to you. Come. Peter, who is focused on Jesus, steps out of the boat because Jesus was doing a new thing. But, but, his focus went off Jesus for a moment. He was very aware of that raging storm. Just like sometimes we are in our life. When Jesus is calling us to him, come. When scripture, when it says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you, it's a promise. Right? And sometimes Jesus says, come. And we get out and we start walking. We're going through impossible situations and we're surviving somehow that we cannot comprehend. But then we become very aware of what's happening in our lives, the thing that caused us pain in the first place. And we say, uh-oh, oh no, and begin to sink. 
and we walk through those fires. We're walking through the rivers and the water's rising and we think we're going to drown and Jesus is there to lift us up. But what Jesus also says to Peter is, why did you doubt? And remember what I said last time, I do not think Peter doubted Christ. I think Peter doubted Christ's ability in himself. See, I am doing a new thing. And here it is. If Jesus is doing a new thing for us, that means we are becoming new as well. See, if Jesus is doing a new thing in our lives, that means we are becoming a new creation, which is the whole purpose of Jesus Christ, to redeem everything, to make it well, to make it whole. Now it springs up. This new thing is springing up in life. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. I love this. What is the visual he's giving here? This is happening. It's happening now. Do you see it? Do you have the ability to perceive what I am doing, the unseen? When God does works in our lives, sometimes we don't see it until it's completed, right? Have you ever had that? Whether it be a character thing or whatever, healing in whatever source, whatever, whatever. A lot of times for me, hindsight is 20-20, especially in my faith. When you look back, you're like, oh, I can't believe I survived that. You look back like, oh, there was, there was God, and there was God, and there was God, and there was God. You don't always feel it, and you're not always aware of it in the moment, but Jesus is saying, do you not see it? It's happening. Do you want to see it? I am making a way in the wilderness. And I love this. When you understand wilderness, you get this idea. Remember where Jesus was. He's in the Middle East. When they say wilderness, you've got to visualize a desert. Okay, I'm talking like miles and miles and miles of sand and heat and dryness and like one cactus right there. Right? You see the cactus? Kind of a cartoon thing. I see it. Yeah, Steve's got it. And here it is. He said, this is where you're at. You're in a place of death. 100%. You're in the desert. You're alone. But I am making a way in that place of death. He doesn't say, I'm going to pluck you out and make things peachy keen for the rest of your life. No. I am making a way in that place of death. And not only that, I'm bringing streams to the wasteland, streams of water. Can you, can you just picture for a second? You know what doesn't grow in the desert? Anything, <laughs> except for stupid cacti. That's it. But if there's water, water brings a source and an opportunity for life to grow where there's nothing but death. Jesus is saying, I know that there's death in your life. I know that you're stuck in a wasteland at times. I know that there's hardship, that there's dryness, that there is nothing. There's desolation. But I'm going to make a way for you to come to me. And not only that, I'm going to bring water to bring life. He's saying, I'm going to bring life to the places in you that are dead because I formed you for myself. See, and when Jesus does a new thing, you've got to remember that even the way that Jesus came as a human being was new. A virgin birth is something new, okay? Growing up and performing healings and miracles is something new. Teaching with such wisdom that it impacted people's lives, the same scripture they had read to them for years, and now all of a sudden there's something more to it, that's something new. Dying on the cross for the sins of all people and the brokenness of all people and the shame of all people is something new. Rising again and giving His Spirit, His Spirit of life, is something new. Can you see it? Can you see what that does? It is the death of religion and the birth of relationship with Jesus. Amen. We get stuck. Do you not see it? I'm doing something new. We get stuck in either our anxiety or our pains. But here's the other thing that came up to me while I was thinking about this. When Jesus is saying, I'm doing a new thing, can you not see it? Sometimes we get stuck on past glories as well. We live in yesterday. And for me, for years, it was the first time I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit movement when I was young. And 
oh, it was so powerful, and there was healings, and there was miracles, and we just we were so connected to God. Oh, I just missed that. God's saying, forget that. That's done. Focus now, tomorrow. Focus on what I want to do in you and the people around you today and tomorrow. It's not just getting stuck in the things that suck. It's getting stuck in the things that were good. And God's saying, don't idolize what was. Focus on me. I'm here with you. Come. Streams in the wasteland. Water equals life, right? What is the ultimate source of life? It's Jesus. John chapter 7 says this. Jesus stood and shouted at the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And verse 39, I love what that John has a little bit of commentary on this for us. This is it. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. When we are stuck, remember that His Holy Spirit can come to us to make ways straight, to give us water to sustain life, to endure and survive the journey. And we are not alone. And you know what it's amazing about all this type of thing is and when we are caught up in anxiety and pain and suffering, God will show up, but maybe not in the ways that we think. It won't be this Hollywood moment where this light comes down, this spotlight straight above over you, and you're like, oh, Jesus, hallelujah. For me, my experience, and maybe it's different for you, the number one way Christ comes to me in those moments is through the voice of his hands and his feet, the church. Because I get isolated, I get cut off. I become deaf to the voice of God, and the leading of God. I become blind to his hands outstretched to me. But... He sends people, and he's in those people to come and be his voice in those moments as well. Which means there needs to be a choice of vulnerability with each other too. And the fact that I've heard from about three or four people this morning who were not connected, I didn't know that each other had the same testimony as, I love being here with these people. That says something. That's powerful. Because this is a group of people that thinks everyone here is worth it, that has value. We love each other. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because Jesus is showing us love and revealing to us the love and value he has for others as well. That song this morning has these two very different perspectives from the first chorus to the last one because Lacey Sturm, the girl who wrote that, had this moment where she saw the new thing that Jesus was doing. The first chorus said, You formed my heart with your own hands, but I just could not understand. If I gave you my life, I'd be healed by your grace. I was made for your love and gave others your place. Compare that to the last chorus where it said, You formed my heart with your own hands, and now I finally understand. And I gave you my life, and I'm Healed by your grace. I was made for your love that no one can replace. This is it. I won't miss everything I'm made for to be yours. That's powerful. There is something powerful in being able to see the work that Jesus is doing that is new. That makes us new. And it has nothing to do with how good we are, how bad we are, how broken and screwed up we are. It has to do with just being open. Don't be defined by your now. Jesus freed us from the influence and identity in the mundane, in our pain, in our shame, in our suffering, in our sin. Jesus said, that does no longer define you. Those chains are broken. I did it there. And as disciples, Jesus calls us to follow him, to become like him, to perceive his life-changing work. And he becomes our main influence impacting our identity. Uh, one of my family's verses that my grandfather used to quote all the time is Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes all things to work for good. We know 
God causes all things to work for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that we can be like him, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a work that is being done. A work of Jesus Christ. And that when he says all things can work together for good, it doesn't mean that all things are going to be good. But I'll tell you, I'll speak for myself. Because I don't want this to come across preachy, so I'm just relating to you. The number one blessing I can get from a crappy circumstance, PG'd it there, that's good, is when I can relate to other people who are suffering in something that I've just been delivered from. There's something powerful about that. That's, that's an ability, that's, that's an opportunity. It's not something that's fun. I won't pretend like it is because it's not. But when Jesus gets you through and he's doing a new thing and he's transforming you and he's letting you survive and he's bringing water in a way that you can get through the desert wasteland. And then you see someone else who's starting that journey, starting the downward spiral. You can love them in effective ways. And it's not just theory. It's experience. That's right. I'd like to invite Wendy forward to share a little something with us this morning. And then I'll close in prayer and we'll have Wes come up and lead us on. I got the opportunity on Tuesday night to speak to some of you about what has been going on in my life lately. 